is cool. Let's go ahead and assume I've made a really inappropriate joke just to break the tension in the room, please. And you laugh. That's very nice. Thank you. It begins as a lump in the throat, like a homesickness. You go to a far secluded place, mentally and physically, or you go to a coffee shop to be surrounded by activity. The point is you find a space and you make a home for yourself and for your work. The first try is always nearly impossible because beginning to work requires a peculiar internal state that ordinary life does not induce. And so you go to your place. If you were a Zulu warrior, banging on your shields for a couple of hours with a couple of hundred other Zulu warriors all banging on their shields, you might be able to work up sufficient energy to begin. If you were an Aztec maiden who was told that in a couple of months you were going to be tossed into a volcano as a human sacrifice, and you spent those months undergoing strange rituals and drinking dubious liquids, you might, when the time came, be ready to begin. And so you go to your place. Words may lie on the horizon, but for the moment, they're utterly inaccessible. And they may remain so for weeks, months, years. Sometimes I'm disquieted by the pause, frustrated and worried that no words exist, or that if words do come, they'll always fail, or that the pause might go on and on. Eventually, though, you lie down a path of words and you follow it. The line of words is a miner's axe, a surgeon's probe. You wield it and it digs a path and you follow. And then you find yourself in new territory. Is this another dead end? Or have you finally found the real subject? You will know in a few days, perhaps, or this time next year if you're lucky. And then will come the moment when you've only produced one page, or perhaps only one line of work all week long, and you're sitting in the darkness feeling like a fraud. And you will know to the depths of your being that the only way out is through the last sentence. But if you work hard and you stick with it, then after many nights of worry and many days of intense concentration to the point of profuse sweating and, and many, many forgotten meals, you will have begun. You may even have made some progress. And then, the middle. The best part, when you're convinced that the work is absolutely important, amused by its slightest jokes, intrigued by its smallest puzzles, at this point it seems possible that the work might just be a metaphor for everything. <laughs> Toward the end, of course, it becomes clear that this is not the case, and alas and alack, it's really just about something. Now the earlier work looks soft and careless. You erase your tracks, telling yourself that the path is not the work. And usually the part that you have to jettison is not only the best part, your most profound work, it is also oddly the very piece that was to have been the point. It is the key originating thought, the very moment on which the rest of it was to hang and from which you yourself drew courage to continue. But you tell yourself that the path is not the work. And so you will continue, full of terror, and the knowledge that you must be generous and give all that you have and never count the cost. That all you can do is sit at the typewriter and open up a vein. But worry not. You will get a break. You can produce something of substance. It is possible. Of course, the chances of anyone breaking through their sloth and limited mind to actually produce something that gets out there in the world and matters to people are very slim. But the rule of the universe seems to be this. Pick something that you love and do it like a bad habit for 10 years, and someone will want a piece of it. The only catch, of course, is that sometimes it takes much less than 10 years, and often much, much more. And yet we plunge forward. In the name of the poet who wrote, I prefer keeping a needle and a thread on hand just in case. I prefer not to maintain that reason is to blame for everything. I prefer the absurdity of writing poetry to the absurdity of not writing poetry. For Kurt Elling, who sang, we are here because it is our intention to add to the sum total of joy and brotherhood in the room, to give expression to the human condition and add something to the plus side of the equation. 
For Saul Williams, who wrote, our music is our alchemy. If you must count to keep the beat, then count. Find your mantra and awaken your subconscious. Curve your circles counterclockwise. Use your cipher, Tutti cipher, coded language and man-made laws. Climb waterfalls and trees. Commune with nature, snakes and bees. Let your children claim themselves and name themselves. For Kelly Okareke, who said, we will not be the last. We will not be the last. We will not be the last. And finally, this is for you. You who said, I reject mediocrity. I will not linger. I will not wait until I have enough. You who said, I will reinvent the wheel. I will race with the wind and shake hands with the hurricane. And I will push back the darkness to make something out of nothing and speak our fears and light up the cave, to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers, to say a new word and make a new thing, to show those bastards, to master a craft and search for understanding, to give back something of what has been given to me and to change this world. This, finally, my friends, is for you. I wish you way more than luck. Thank you very much.